and welcome to the Trend Micro Session at the Cloud Architecture Summit. Let me introduce to you two great speakers today. First, from Trend Micro, we have Paul Hartop, Head of Security for Conformity, part of the Trend Micro Cloud One. And alongside Paul, we have with us Jason Craddett, Principal Cloud Architect at 1898 Co., a Trend Micro customer who's going to provide some great frontline insight for us today. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. All right. And Paul and Jason are going to combine together with a great session, how Burns and McDonald are assessing for action, building efficient cloud architectures. You know, with the rapid provisioning capabilities of cloud infrastructures, security and cloud development teams are overburdened often with cloud sprawls and also the intricacies of setting up the cloud in a secure way. So luckily for us, Jason and Paul are going to team up to show us how Cloud One is helping companies, including 1898 and Co., automatically assess and improve their environment for innovation and operational excellence with a secure cloud architecture. So it's a really great session that we've got with some real world insight as well as best practices. So let me just remind you before we begin, you can download the slides this morning and I highly recommend you do. Just hit that big written under the view screen. Under that, you'll see we have other valuable PDF downloads for you all set. And if you have questions, just type in the submit a question box into the view screen and we'll get them directly to our speakers. So with that, tell us about building efficient cloud architectures ready for assessment and action. Wow, what a great introduction, thank you. My name is Paul Hortop and I'm head of security for Trend Micro Conformity. Conformity is a cloud security posture management tool. And in this session, Jason Craddit, the principal cloud architect for 1898 & Co is going to tell us about his company's journey with the AWS well-architected framework. But first I'm going to start by talking about some of the challenges you may face and then introduce the well-architected framework before handing over to Jason for some real world examples. So why might you need a cloud security posture management tool? So one of the typical customer journeys that I see is someone runs a proof of concept on AWS and it is so successful, it immediately becomes a production workload and it's there for the next year and there is infrastructure deployed into multiple regions, lots of new accounts are created. It's so easy to buy things that just get added onto the AWS build, there's stuff all over the place. Security is an issue, cost is an issue. And at that time, it's really useful to bring in a tool like Conformity that very quickly just bursts through those regional boundaries and shows you if you've got security challenges around S3 buckets that are open to the internet, if you've got EC2 instances that are open to the internet on say SSH or RDP and also helps you identify where you've got infrastructure that is running that no one owns that you're being charged a lot for. So that's one of the pain points that you might feel. Then you may be looking to migrate a on-premise workload to the cloud and it will be using an AWS service that you've never seen before. So having a tool that from day one has got all the best practices embedded into it, you can create that new infrastructure in a test account and optimize it from day one. Another challenge that you may face, you may have an audit coming up in a year's time. You've no idea what standard you're going to be audited to, and you don't really know how to prepare your cloud infrastructure for that audit. So again, a tool like Conformity allows you to come in and, and produce a, a baseline of where all the challenges are, where all the technical debt is in your environment. You baseline it on day one. It gives you a very easy way to look at all the failures that you've got in your environment, filter them based on criticality and on the number of failures. And then every week you're able to tackle the next most important thing that needs fixing and you're able to produce a report every month. And then when the auditors come in, you're able to say, well, we started here and every month we've fixed this, this, and this, and this is the journey that we're on. And we're working towards complying with the well-architected framework or something like the CIS benchmark. The last challenge that I would highlight here is if you're running a workload in AWS and you haven't refactored it in a year, there are probably opportunities to go and find better 
EC2s that have a better performance or are cheaper, or there may be new security practices that have been introduced in that year. So everything needs re-looking at at that time. So now I'm going to take a look at the well-architected framework. So the well-architected framework isn't an abstract architectural thing that only architects deal with. It's really based on all the best practices that AWS have identified over the year, putting them into five pillars so that they've got a real structure. And then they allow you to get some real advantages in building infrastructure in day-to-day -day life. And I'll give you an example here. If you are going to build a Microsoft SQL database running on the RDS service, the relational database service on AWS, and it's going into production and it's running a production workload, then there are huge advantages in building that right from day one. You want to have it encrypted. You want to have it so that it is available in multi availability zones. And you want to turn on auto minor updates. And all of those will just mean that your database runs so much easier from day one. And if I just take one of those encryption, if you don't build it encrypted from day one, and then in six months time, you decide, right, we now need to encrypt that database and you've never done that in production before, that's a real challenge. You're going to have to bring that database to a steady state, shut it down, take a snapshot of it, build a new database that's got the encryption flag set, and then restore from that backup that you took and then bring the database back up. That's really hard to do. And if you can do that on the day that you build the database, then you'll be so much further ahead. So now I'm gonna hand you over to Jason and he's going to take us through his experience at 1898 and Co. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Well, many of you, if you've worked in the cloud and technology space, you probably haven't heard of Burns and McDonald or 1898. So I'll just take a quick moment and tell you who we are. Burns and McDonald is a hundred year plus organization founded in the year 1898, really set out to build and construct physical assets in the world. As you can see from the graphic on the left, this could be buildings, refineries, or even power generation facilities like nuclear and coal and wind and similar. And as we move to the right in time, what we saw was an opportunity to help not only build physical infrastructure in the world, but digital infrastructure for our customers. And that could be things like, how do we automate wind farms and, and use drone technologies to assess physical assets in the world and similar. We're based here in Kansas City with around 7,500 or so professionals and we're 100% employee owned. So we are focused on our own company and our own customers and never Wall Street and where we think the market should take us. And as Paul introduced, me and, and I think it's important to realize I'm a new employee to Burns and McDonald. As a principal architect, I come into a brownfield environment, meaning, you know, Burns and McDonald in 1898 have built in the cloud for years. This isn't new, but they came to me and I started here to help build and help us mature how we build a little bit better. But they first started with two problems. The first problem was Jason, how can we decrease the cost of our Amazon environment? And now what they weren't focused on is, oh my God, the bill is so high, what can we do? But if you think about cloud and, and elasticity and the measure of cost and value, what they wanted to do is take the value we were getting and the cost we were paying and bring those a little bit closer into an alignment. And so it wasn't like this exorbitant cost. We were instead really focused on the cost and value and putting those things closer together. On the other hand, they said, how can we improve security? Now, again, we weren't focused on like, oh my gosh, the ship is sinking. There's all these holes, let's plug them. Instead, we were focused on, we want to continue to maintain and do the best we can to protect our customers' data and our own data. So how can we do that? Now, these two things often are, are kind of maybe in contention with each other, right? I mean, how can we add security features but decrease cost? It just doesn't make sense. And so as a new employee, I wanted to use my SME knowledge for building in the cloud for years and look at our environment and drive how I could do that, how I could drive down cost and increase security. But I needed a good framework to fit that into. And of course, as Paul mentioned, we thought 
what better to work on than the well-architected framework that Amazon has presented with us? These five pillars are very well documented, easily to understand, and really easily implement. But we needed to really square up and focus on just security and cost right now. Inevitably, we'll move further to the left. And that's a fun pun, just as we talk about moving left in DevOps, we'd move left in the well-architected framework as well to focus on performance efficiency and operational excellence. But as a new employee, I first needed to prove the value of myself and of the cloud architectures that we support. So I said, that's the job, let's focus here. And as I thought about how I could use as an SME, the well architected framework, I thought of three different assessment methods. First, the manual method, me as an SME going in, rolling up my sleeves and saying, here, we could do this. We could you know, update these security groups and update you know, Postgres versions and do these patches and similar, but that's just me driving into the console, giving it a once over and, and driving a list of recommendations. On the far right, the guided meth message, which would be somebody says, well, here's all the questions you could go ask in a guided format to say, well, have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? And walk through a guided assessment of our environment. And then finally, an automated method where we could just say, go tell me, Mr. Automation, what's going on in our system? Tell me what I could fix and I'll go fix it. All of three had values. And at the end of the day, we implemented all three. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. We started with the manual method. And in that method, we started with me just rolling up my sleeves and looking. And what's interesting about this as a new employee, this provided a lot of value. It gave me an, a place to start to look at hundreds of EC2 instances sitting out there. And man, who knows how many pages of RDS instances. And I got to drive down and understand the architecture, you know, what it was that was in our environment, who it served. And in doing so, I got to see some very obvious things we could do. Things like if you think about security groups and security groups, you could deploy all web servers into a security group. So all your front end would be in, a, in, in one security group. And then all of your back end, like RDS instances and similar would be in, in the back end security group. Well, we got the opportunity to change our mindsets and start to move to security groups that focused on just that workload. So you could say, all right, now that is just for that workload. And in doing so, we improve security because we reduce the blast radius between workloads. But it doesn't increase cost at all. It's just a simple thing we could go do that helps increase security and doesn't add any cost. Now, certainly we saved some money in doing this. We found some inefficiencies, opportunities to consolidate and similar. But at the end, we really only saved about 5% of our overall bill, which is, I say only, what a great win. We saved a little bit of cash there to help prove that me as an SME, I added some value to our organization, but also I had, I improved security. And, and I think I could defend that by saying, look at my architecture and see that. But to defend that security, I had to tell that story. You had to trust Jason with that story. And because we're not the types to give up, we said, well, what else could we do? And we knew about the well-architected tool that Amazon provides and we thought, great. Let's go through it. There's 70 to 80 or so questions. They guide you through the questions and say, have you thought about this? What about that? Where do you encrypt? How do you think about deployment and similar? And that provided us a great conversation. It gave us a great starting point to think about the, what do we value in our organization today for a well-architected framework? And where could we mature better in our organization to focus more on designing and building and supporting applications in the cloud? And then we said, man, we've learned a lot. What else can we do? And we said, well, there's automated tools. And certainly we came to Trend Micro and said, how can you help us? And they said, have you heard of conformity? And certainly we said, well, let's give it a try. One of my key points was we didn't want to add cost and to pay for something. It was a little like, man, all right, let's give it a shot. But we did it and we did a proof of concept. And in that proof of concept, in one week, we were able to identify about 15% cost savings for our bill. And those are things that are just not easily found in a manual method. Things like, yeah, we forgot we were exploring in this dev capacity something in a different region. Forgot to mention that. Oh, shoot. Well, let's go look at that and see how we can scale it. 
But it also gave us what I would say is kind of situational awareness. And what I mean by that is in the automated tool, it would come back and say, have you thought about maybe trimming this EC2 instance down? It looks over provisioned. And it would give us data that says, this is why we think it's over provisioned. And then I could go look. Now, certainly in a manual context, I could have logged into CloudWatch. I could have looked at and seen week over week, you know, what the performance indicators for that service were. But here it was, instead of me going and looking, it just said, hey, have you thought about this in an automated way? So it reduced our discovery time, or as the slide says, a mean time to discovery by about 50%, because now it just said, hey, go look here. So maybe 50% is a not generous enough number, because now I don't have to go look. It just said, go get it, go look here, go look there. And one of the great things about this, as I mentioned on the manual side, you had to trust Jason. You had to trust that I said, this is secure. Now look, I've got an ego as we all do. I think I'm pretty good at my job, but, but I'm not the security professionals that Trend Micro has, the, the thousands or so. And I'm not the thousands of security professionals or even cloud architect professionals that Amazon has. And these rules, these thousands of rules that get checked in an automated fashion, well, they're there telling me, hey, go look at this. Hey, go look at that. So no, now you don't have to think about me. You have to say, well, does, do we trust Amazon with how they think cloud security should go? And do we trust Trend with how cloud security should go? And of course, the answer is yes. But doing so, it provides a measurable output. Instead of just trusting me, they say, hey, we check these thousand things. And of those thousand things, we don't think you're quite right yet in these 10 or 50 or whatever it is. But that gives us a scoreboard. And that scoreboard is not one where we have to go push the button to say add a point or not, because it's con constantly checking and looking for how you doing today, right now in this meeting. So no matter where we are, we can see our score, we can see how we're doing, and we can pit ourselves and kind of gamify ourselves to move forward. And the results really kind of speak for themselves. You know, as I was asked, how could we decrease cost? And I was able to save about 20% in my first months here on the job. And on the security side, we were able to improve our risk score driven by Trend Micro by about 30 points. Now, what's interesting about this is some of these 30 points, it may seem dramatic, but some of them are really simple, like encrypting an AMI instance. It's a great practice. Of course, you should do it. It's not something I would have thought of in the manual review, but when doing so, it kind of moves security upstream a little bit, because if you encrypt the AMI, when you go to deploy it, it will be deployed encrypted. And so by doing that, we improve not only the score for what we have today, but as soon as something gets released, it's also secured. And so by doing some of those things that may not have impacted the security of the environment as it existed today, it made it more secure as we continue to iterate on those environments moving forward. And that's where we saw a huge increase in our risk score moving forward. And that is winning in my book. But the key takeaways I want you to think about is that every assessment method had certain value. Certainly, if I would have just thrown an automated tool against the environment, I wouldn't have understood the context of all of my environments. I wouldn't have understood why that web server needs to talk to that database server in inverse, why that web server doesn't need to talk to the other one or why an S3 bucket needs to be public or not. You can't go get that today anyway, in an automated context. You have to go ask the questions. You have to understand the environment at some degree. And so having some of those manual check-ins to review the architecture and understand it were super important. Of course, looking at a guided methodology, we got to understand our organization and where we were maturity-wise and how we could continue to push ourselves further and further to mature and think about building better and better for our customers every day. And in the automated capacity, I think the greatest thing for me was the scoreboard because I'm a geek and I love to continue to win. And it showed me that I was able to win no matter where I was. I can go check the scoreboard and see how my team was doing and see how we were progressing in the environment. And that scoreboard was excellent. But the scoreboard was a much higher threshold as well. It gave me thousands of data points that I could go check and try to understand how we could go learn and how we could go build. And so really all of them helped me win in short order here at Burns and Mac in 1898. And so 
I'll pass it back over to Paul and he'll tell you a little bit about more than just assessments and where else you could take this technology. Paul? Jason, that was awesome. So what I'd like to do now is just recap on trend micro conformity. It's like adding an AWS expert to your team, it gives you the best practice for all those AWS services, but, but not just the best practice for over 550 checks, but also detailed remediation guidance for each one of those failures. And the tool tells you really clearly how to go and check for the failure using the console or the command line interface, how to fix it using the console or the command line interface, and then also where you can go and find that original AWS documentation that detailed that specific best practice. It also includes auto remediation. So imagine your production environment and you get it stable and you know that you have two S3 buckets that are serving static content for a web server. They're the only two buckets that you have that are public facing. So it's really easy to deploy our auto remediation capability. And then the moment if someone inadvertently creates an S3 bucket that is open to the internet, it will be shut down within two minutes. You can build conformity into your CI CD tool chain. It's really easy. If you're using something like Jenkins, you can very simply from there call conformity and say for this stack that's just been deployed, if there are any critical or very high failures, don't allow it to go any further. You're also able to create text alerts for critical security events. So for example, if someone signs in as root or a public or an S3 bucket is made public, then you can have these sent straight away in real time to your chief security officer. So now I'll move on to the next slide. Conformity is part of a much wider security suite called Cloud One. And here Trend Micro has brought together in a single platform, all sorts of really great cloud security capabilities. So you can, from here, scan your S3 buckets for malware. You can have a network intrusion prevention system deployed. You can secure your workloads on EC2s. There are a ton of different capabilities for scanning and securing your containers. And you can automatically protect your applications against common web-based attacks and zero days. So that concludes our formal session. And now I'll hand back to Vance to see if there are any questions. Paul, Jason, great session. And we really love the big picture look for the architects that are here, but also the really frontline view that Jason gave for the implementers here. Really great mix of insights that I'm sure our audience has benefited from. So we've got quite a few questions here. Before I get to them, let me thank you very much for a great session. Thanks, Vance. That was awesome. Thank you. No, our pleasure, guys. Our pleasure, for sure. You know, I said we have a mix of questions. Let's start at the top level and then get right into the implementation dimension. You both mentioned kind of a maturity model, I guess, if we could call it that, for assessments. And a couple of comments. Let me kind of pull them together here. Can you share some tips of how companies can move from manual, which many people use, through guided and what you called automated? Why don't you go first, Jason? Sure. Yeah, Vance, I think, you know, I think each one has its own value, uh, but you do want to move into automated pretty quick. But I would argue you don't want to move before you have good contextual knowledge of your environment and of the architecture itself. Without that contextual knowledge, some of the key points that the automated tool like conformity might point out, you may not want to automatically remediate, or you might not want to remediate at all, even in the manual context. So it's important really to understand the environment. And one of the great things we found when we were using conformity was certainly it found things that maybe didn't align with best practices, but we were like, we know why we did that and we have a great reason for it. So we could just say, suppress that for now, like just take it off, don't account against our scoreboard for it but it allowed us that flexibility to take our SME knowledge about our environment and then also use the tool to quickly automate and check for all sorts of those as they come up. So I would argue you wanna move into automated quick because it gives you such a wide breadth of 
findings and checks and that you can go review your environment against, but I don't think you should rush without getting a good understanding of your organization's maturity to be like Paul said, adding it in to a CICD pipeline. I wouldn't do that without the context and without understanding your organizational maturity. Paul, would you build on that? Yeah, sure. I think Jason, some really great points that I would just add that quite often initially when you're looking to go from manual to automatic, there is complete chaos. You've got thousands and thousands of failures within your environment and lots of practices that can be improved upon and you're not going to be able to fix them straight away. So you're going to have to come up with a remediation plan and you might do something like this month, we're going to look at identity and access management and sort out the way that you know, we make sure that all of our users are using MFA when they log in, that they're all in groups, that no one has got an administrative policy that's directly attached to them. And then the month after, you might go and look at your EC2 fleet and make sure that you don't have any instances that are open to the internet. And then you'll start to discover things like infrastructure as code. So the more infrastructure as code that you can be using in the environment and the more that you promote that as something that everyone has to do and all the changes are made in the infrastructure as code, you can then accelerate what you're doing because you'll be able to move to a place where you're only fixing things once. So if you identify a poor practice, you brief all of the engineers, for example, we can't have any security groups for EC2s that are open on SSH port 22 to the internet. So you brief all of the engineers and also ensure that for all infrastructure that they build, there are templates for that infrastructure and all the templates are updated to have that. Then you'll avoid the going and deleting those security groups or updating them and changing them and then them just reappear in the next month and you're doing this continual whack-a-mole. And by adopting a process like that, you'll be able to improve the environment and then you'll be able to get to a true automated position where you know all your infrastructure in production, everything is as it should be. And then when you get a report in, it's just showing you a variance against the baseline that you're trying to establish. What a well-articulated group of answers there because both of you guys, as you put it together, you really underscore the sense that doing it trend micro cloud one conformity way, not only do I get great insights on questions and metrics I'm looking for, but I also get some guidance on what questions to ask even and how to prioritize them. And Paul, as you said, it certainly can be overwhelming. So this idea of getting a tap on the shoulder of this you can worry about, this you don't have to worry about for now without getting in trouble does seem like another benefit to the way you've done this. So something like conformity is going to tell you for your Greenfields deployment that you're building everything right from the get-go and there are so many advantages to building it right the first time. Brownfields are a different problem. You know, you've got the regional boundary, you might have 500 accounts and across there, initially you're going to be getting that visibility of your security posture, putting out the security fires. And then I would encourage something like head of security and head of DevOps sitting down every month and looking at the next 10 things that you can change in your network that will make a material difference to the way your engineers work, to the security of your platform and to the performance of your infrastructure. Wow, excellent, excellent. This is really rich with best practices, guys. Let's spend a minute or two talking about Trend Micro technology in particular. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. We'll put them together. Which Trend Micro tools or technologies have you found are proving most useful to customers for this kind of cloud migration or cloud operations? And certainly talk about conformity or cloud one as a whole, if you want. One of the things that I like about Trend Micro and have for years and years was almost from the moment that AWS was created, they came along with their deep security products. That took all your traditional security tools that you had on premise, your anti-malware, making sure that files aren't being changed, a host firewall, all of those capabilities and put it together as a package on AWS. And here we are again, many years later, and they've brought all the different capabilities that are out there. So again, the advantages of being able to buy a single product that does everything that you need for cloud security. So you've got one relationship with one vendor, one 
management platform and one bill at the end of the month and all of those different capabilities. And it doesn't matter how you're running your application. So if you're serverless, if you're running containers or you've still got a large EC2 fleet, then all of the capabilities are there. And also the new capabilities that you need today. So for example, one of those sounds like a small use case. If you're having to produce documents and files for your customers and you need a anti-malware service that scans those to ensure that there is no malware in any of the files that you're providing to your customers, having a solution that is neatly embedded into your S3 file management chain that scans and marks files as having been scanned, that is one of those capabilities that is unique to the cloud and it is difficult to get hold of. So the Trend Micro Cloud One platform has got all these different capabilities and they're all designed to work with each other and complement each other. Fantastic, fantastic. And Jason, let's turn to you about your kind of end user customer expertise. I have a question here for you. What's next for Burns and McDonald? What do you see as being the biggest challenges as well as maybe some opportunities in security as we move forward? Yeah, you know, what's next for us at Burns and McDonald? We're going to continue to build. We've got a lot of ideas about things we can build, but also we're working to help our customers build and help them understand maybe where we've struggled, where they can gain the benefit of our experiences from Burns or other companies we've all worked for. So we're going to continue to build. We've got some ideas around the energy space about how to help monitor and help our customers understand capital asset planning. And so we can build tools, but we can take tools into these heavily regulated environments and we can do so feeling a little bit more secure because we have partners like Amazon and Trend in our corner. Excellent, excellent session, guys. You know, I see time is just about up, but before we go, we can't let you leave without giving us a little hint as to what our attendees could do to follow in the steps of Burns and McDonald. Paul, perhaps give us an idea. Are there ways to get more technical info or even take a hands-on trial or a sandbox environment with conformity? I would say go ahead and use our trial. You're under no obligation. And the worst that will happen is that you are able to very quickly light up your AWS environment, region through region, account through account, and see immediately what challenges that you have there. Excellent, excellent. And Jason, just uh, kind of a heads up, what would you recommend an attendee that wanted to follow in your footsteps to get a sense without, as you said so well a few minutes ago, uh, without being overwhelmed? I think the best thing to do is just start. You know, often if you look at a blank screen, it's really scary to think about what you're going to write and where you're going to start. But once you have somebody to say, have you thought about this? With the breadth of experience from Amazon and Trend Micro, you can start to go, ah, I need to think about that. So yeah, plug it in, see what happens. The good news is it takes 10 to 15 minutes to get started. Just plug it in and then it gives you immediate direction on where you should go think about and it helps prioritize your thinking and it helps you focus and know if you're making progress or not. And to me, again, that's the biggest takeaway is that you want to be able to see yourself progressing, but you need to know what steps to take to progress. So why not get started? Just plug it in and start getting the value. Yeah, well said, well said. It sounds like it's all upside and Trend Micro and its approach to a free trial makes it easy to do it also. So let me thank Paul Hortop, Head of Security for Conformity, a part of Trend Micro Cloud One, and Jason Craddock, Principal Cloud Architect at 1898 and Co. Really great session. You guys really make a great team. And we want to thank you very much for giving us an overview of how we can safely move forward with uh, cloud-focused security and especially for taking all the questions. Thanks, Vance. Thanks, Vance. Our pleasure. Our pleasure, guys. And just a quick note before we wrap up here with this great session, a quick reminder, you can get a copy of the slides. Just take a look at that red button under the view screen, as well as those great assets. There's also the link to the free trial that Paul mentioned. So much going on, we didn't have room for everything. So here is a slide that'll take you to some other great resources at Trend Micro website. All you need to do is download the slide deck and all these links will be live. Thanks again, everyone.